can't tell you very much about what's going to happen today, but I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. Um, so please join me in well, like, welcoming Gary Kobe's. Thank you. Um, I was told to start off with uh, telling a little bit about myself. Uh, so the first thing we're going to get straightened out, I am not an expert, regardless of what the Chinook Observer said. <laughs> But uh, I think Sydney wrote this up, so I, I guess I'll have to blame her. <laughs> um, I've been involved in um, the historical aspects of our community for probably about 10 years. Uh, I've been active with the uh, uh, Columbia Pacific Heritage Museum, uh, completed the second class of the um, Community Historian Project. My general historical interests lie in Northwest transportation, uh, railroads in particular, and I'm what they call a foamer. Uh, at least that's what the railroad people call people who stand alongside the tracks and take pictures of trains and uh, get excited when they see stuff moving. So anyway, things that make noise and move are kind of my area of interest. Uh, my wife Connie is with me today. She's in a help out a little bit during the presentation. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, I grew up in central Washington, moved to the peninsula in 2003. Uh, we live in Chinook. Um, I am a port commissioner in Chinook. Uh, had a public meeting the other night uh, and we're going to raise taxes. And I was expecting uh, a lot of arrows and hatchets coming our way, but it turned out pretty nice. And, uh, Kenny back there would be able to testify. It was a friendly crowd. That, uh, yeah. One person even asked, how can we raise them more? So, <laughs> uh, I'm also uh, on the board of the Columbia Pacific Heritage Museum and the Columbia River Maritime Museum and have been the treasurer for the Mar Maritime Museum for the past three years. Uh, this particular presentation was an outgrowth of my history in railroading and it was originally, in its original form, was put together for the, night, uh, the 2013 National Narrow Gauge Convention in Pasadena, California. And Mark Clemens and I uh, both went down to that. I think most of you know Mark. Uh, and both made presentations. And uh, so this was this presentation was put together. And I've since modified it to make it a little less railroading and a little more general interest uh, because I think there's a great story here to be told. And so um, the. Uh, photo that you see there is from a postcard uh, that uh, is attributed to the uh, Tacoma Public Library. That's a picture of the uh, uh, jetty trestle tramway going out into the surf at the mouth of the Columbia River. Don't know when it was taken, any date or anything, but uh, that's what it is. The, uh, the jetty project uh, Certainly not as big as some, but in its own right was a very unique and a world-class project. They had, uh, they didn't have the knowledge at the time they started this, which was in the 1880s, uh, to know where they were going to end up. And in the documentation, it even says that we're going to start out, we'll see how it goes, and then we'll, we'll adjust as we go along. And that's exactly what happened. The jetty that we see today is only part of what was intended when they began this project. It really, what is really important is what lies under the surface of the river that we don't see. And um, it started uh, in about 1880. Uh, the business community in Portland uh, was shipping uh, a lot of goods all around the world. And the Columbia River Bar was always a problem. The river itself uh, 
had a passable navigation channel, but they couldn't load ships fully in Portland, and they would have to bring them down to Astoria, about three quarters full, and then they would do what they call lightering, use smaller boats to bring the balance of the cargo out and load the ship with full capacity. And the mouth of the Columbia River at that time was um, a pretty treacherous place, and uh, so the need, uh, sometimes ships would have to wait as much as a month to be able to make pa safe passage out of Astoria once they were loaded. And then it was dangerous. Um, and ships coming in also would have to wait offshore for extended periods of time. So the, uh, and, and we were having all the shipwrecks, so all this stuff was going on and the business community starts pushing for uh, improvements to the mouth of the river. And that was about 1882 when the first uh, effort was made to start getting the legislation to fund this of the Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers or the U.S. Engineers as they were known at the time uh, started drafting plans and so it evolved that uh, by 1885 the first authorization was made and the first 10-year project on the South Jetty was completed in 1895 and then it sat dormant for about eight years while they figured out what the river was actually doing and they realized they needed to do additional work so the South Jetty extension took another 10 years from 1903 to 1913 and in the midst of that they knew that they had to do something on the uh, north uh, shore of the Columbia River and Cape Disappointment and so they began planning the uh, construction of the North Jetty and that followed on uh, right after the completion of the South Jetty. So from 1913 to 1917, the North Jetty was under construction. Then in the 30s, um, they did repairs to the jetty. About 20 years had gone by, and they were able to observe what wave action was doing and how they needed to uh, uh, reinforce the uh, the existing jetties in a certain way. And then they were observing that the currents were undercutting the, the ground under the North Jetty and so they began an effort which started with pile dikes on Sand Island and then culminated in the building of Jetty A somewhere between 1938 and 1940. I've never been able to get it down. Um, and between the pile dikes and the North Jetty that forced the currents away from the uh, understructure of the, the North Jetty and forced the flat spit to stay on the inside of the river. And so they kind of, that's what stabilized in the end the, the mouth of the river. But this is a 50 year process that was done by a number of different people working over a long period of time. And uh, at the same time they were doing this, there was a major construction project at Fort Canby, uh, improving defenses at uh, Fort Stevens, and the building of Fort Columbia. So there was a tremendous amount of construction activity going on at the time. This is a timeline uh, from 1885 to uh, around 1940. And you can see the uh, construction of the South Jetty Jetty and then the, the pile legs. And during this time, there was a tremendous growth in the uh, population, not only uh, in Washington, Oregon, but California. So the whole West Coast uh, was uh, growing tremendously. We had the transition from uh, sailing ships to steamships. We had uh, about 1884 is when. Portland was connected by rail to the rest of the United States. And so all of this is happening in an area, uh, in an area in a period of time where really rapid growth is taking place. This is what we see today. This is uh, the uh, uh, Fort Stevens 
state park, the tip of it out there, and uh, Cape Disappointment up in here. And it's about two miles from the tip of the south jetty to the tip of the uh, north jetty. In um, 1885, when they were starting this process, the white line <coughs> is the shoreline as it existed back then. Uh, you can see quite a bit of change. And it was six miles, uh, six miles plus from Point Adams to Cape Disappointment. So there's been a tremendous change in the landscape as a result of doing this. The problems they had were that uh, both Clats uh, of Spit, which is this area, and uh, the uh, Peacock. Peacock Spit, the of the uh, would move back and forth uncontrollably. And then they had what were called the middle sand, so there were always two channels. And prevailing winds from the south and squalls from the west, <coughs> ships would have to navigate and think of doing this as a sailing ship, it's a little bit different than steering uh, a steamship. And so that's what made the passage so difficult and so treacherous. Um, the, the original thought for a jetty, uh, this was about 1882-83, was what was called a pile dike, and it's a series of wooden pilings, and they were proposed to do eight pilings across, and each of these pilings, as they're driven in, are then tied together with uh, wooden beams and bolted together. So it was going to be eight piles wide and about 8,000 feet long. And uh, that idea was then scrapped, and they decided to build a what's called a rubble mound jetty. And so that's what was ultimately constructed here. Um, the visible part of the jetty is, is the rock pilings that we see today. Uh, but the shape of the bottom is called bathymetry. And uh, it's the shape and volume and depth of the uh, river channel below the water. And so, there are a series of maps coming up here that are going to show the changes to the bathymetry of the uh, mouth of the river. And as the bathymetry changes, the landform starts to change. This is uh, the first chart that was prepared by uh, Captain Vancouver, and it was done in 1792. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it shows all of the uh, high ground away from the uh, bank of the river. And we know that uh, particularly around Chinook uh, and on the uh, Astoria side of the river, all of the hillside comes right down. There's no acre of land there. The next uh, chart was done in 1839 and uh, was done by uh, Sir Edward Belcher of Great Britain. And it's a more precise map. This is this is not actually his map. This is a map that was prepared by the Corps of Engineers based on his chart. And the thing you can see here is they're starting to represent the high ground uh, right at the edge of the river, both on both sides, and here at Cape Disappointment. But you can see the two channels uh, that come into the the river and the middle sands, and every year these move back and forth, so it was totally unpredictable. And, and along with this movement, uh, the, the middle sands would also move around. So in 1885, the uh, U.S. engineers adopted the plan for the South Jetty which would come off of Fort Stevens and uh, be about four miles long and would arc up towards a point.
point off of Cape Disappointment. And uh, by the time this chart was done, um, you can see the, the middle sands had descended from Peacock Spit all the way down here, and there was basically one entrance that at this time was kind of uh, shielded by the middle sands, and you have flats of spit extending up here. But basically, one entrance point into the river. So, after 10 years of construction by 1895, jetty extended to the point where they intended. Flats of spit had been somewhat tamed, and the force of the current was keeping uh, the channel open along here, and the middle sands had migrated up and they have become what was known as Sand Island today. So this massive sand that was out here uh, slowly got forced by the currents up here. And it's not that the, the sand itself that was in the middle of the river, but it's like washing down your driveway with a hose. You kind of wash it off to the side, and uh, it, it aggregates at the, at the side of the driveway. Uh, and that's kind of what they were attempting to do here. Um, they went through a period um, where they uh, where they completed the uh, first phase of the South Jetty. Uh, they increased the channel depth from about 20 feet to about 30 feet, and if you think about uh, a lot of the ships that were coming in and out were probably drawing 16 to, to 20 feet. And if you have 30 feet, that's only 10 feet between the bottom of the ship and the uh, bottom of the river. And when you're crossing uh, uh, an area of rough water and the ship is pitching up and down, um, you run the risk of possibly striking the bottom with your bow or your stern. And so maintaining that depth is critical. And uh, it lasted to about 19 or 1897, two years after it was completed. And then it started to slowly uh, build back up again. And uh, so they knew that they had to do uh, some additional work. And what was proposed was an extension of the South Jetty. And at the time they were doing this, they realized they also needed to do something north. So this was the, the North Jetty was planned at the time the second phase of the South Jetty started, but it wasn't actually executed until the South Jetty was completed, or the second phase of the South Jetty was completed. So by 1916, the, uh, the uh, second phase of the South Jetty had extended out a couple of more miles. Uh, the North Jetty had been constructed, and again, the river is stable and uh, pretty close to the depth that they wanted to maintain. Then by 1950, um, after it was all complete, Actually, it was completed in 1940, but this report that this is based on was done in 1950. Um, you can see, again, the channel is complete. They've got the installation of the pile dikes along the base of Sand Island and Jetty A construction down here. And so the base of the uh, North Jetty is now protected. And the uh, formation of flats of spit is also pretty stable, so they had the depth and the configuration that they wanted for shipping traffic. One interesting thing is that after, we'll see in some photos later on, when uh, the North Jetty was built, the shoreline pretty much followed this green area right here. When the Jetty was built, sand began to accrete, and so between uh, 1917 and 1950, they estimate that 48 million cubic yards of sand uh, accreted in the area that we now know as Benson Beach. 
and there was also accretion along the North Shore Line and the South Shore Line. But this this particular place uh, had a tremendous amount of sand buildup. Uh, this is a quote from uh, the Hickson and Rudolph report. Uh, in 1885, the outer face of the bar was approximately three miles west of Cape Disappointment. Construction of the jetties forced the bar further into the ocean so that by 1900, the outer face of the bar had advanced one mile. And by 1950, the extreme western position of the sea face of the bar was over five miles west of Cape Disappointment. Uh, as the outer perimeter of the bar advances into the ocean, the original water depth increases and the rate of advance becomes less. So basically, the formation of the jetties pushed the face of the bar out two miles uh, from where it was when they started. And as the sea floor slopes off, uh, what, what he's saying is the rate of advancement, even though you move more material, it takes more material. Out, but it had reached a point of stability at about five miles out. So this is a comparison of uh, what it looked like before the beginning of the construction of the South Jetty, uh, and then the landform changes that you see compared to this buildup of Clatsop Spit at the beach south of Clatsop Spit, buildup of Benson Beach and accretion. Uh, up on the uh, Long Beach. And Long Beach probably has created about half a mile from the time the uh, jetty construction started to where it is today. And I guess some of that is now moving back out again. So this is what they did and how did they do it? Uh, this is kind of a depiction of the original jetty design they were talking about, uh, a pile-like jetty. And these pilings are driven into the ground. This is looking down from the top in a staggered pattern, and then they run a beam between them uh, and bolt them all together. It makes a pretty sturdy structure. And at low tide, this would have been exposed quite a bit, and at high tide, uh, less so. Then they abandoned this idea uh, and went to the more traditional rubble mound jetty, which is rubble mound is basically a pile of rocks. <laughs> uh, but the uh, the intent was that this was a mid-tide jetty, so that at low tide the top of the jetty would be exposed above the water, and at low tide the entire jetty would be covered. And this was how the first phase was constructed. And then uh, after uh, 1895, between 1895 and 1903, when they were evaluating what had happened uh, to, the, to the base of the river, the bathymetry, uh, they concluded that they need to build a jetty that would be above the water, both at high tide and low tide. And Excuse me a minute, Gary. Gary was a trip. I didn't call mine. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an engineering drawing of what's called a bent. And a bent is a, uh, an assemblage of materials. In this case, uh, four wooden pilings that are driven into the ground. Then they're cross-braced. Uh, a pile cap is set on top, and then stringers are set on top of that, on which they build the railroad. Uh, and um, this is a later engineering drawing. This is one of the uh, drawings that uh, I found at the Columbia River Maritime Museum. It's, it's an original uh, U.S. engineer's drawing uh, of the, the jetty. And you can see that um, at low tide, the top of this jetty is uh, exposed, and at high tide, it's covered. And this is an end view, and this is a side view. Uh, but the, uh, the trestle itself sticks up uh, well above the uh, surface of the water. 
And then at the uh, Clatsop County Historical Society, I found several drawings, but uh, these, this one and the next one really tell the story about how, how they did it. So you see these series of pilings. They were put in at about 16 feet apart. And so you have all, each of these bits has to be constructed. And it was constructed <coughs> using a pile driver. And this pile driver, uh, I call the mother of all pile drivers, is about 60 feet from the top of the railing to the top of this. And then it's sitting 30 to 40 feet above the, uh, the full, uh, bottom of the river. And um, so you can imagine if you were a worker having to be up on top of that handling mm -hmm. lines in a 20, 25, 30, 35 mile an hour wind with uh, rain coming down, it would uh, be, be a pretty tough job. Uh, but this was steam powered. This is the boiler. Uh, this is the uh, uh, basically the drive that operates all the lights that uh, feed this. Uh, they run through this uh, this derrick, uh, and then they also used they would attach a pipe alongside the piling, and rather than drive the piling into the ground all the way, they would use a water jet and basically jet the pile down in as far as they could feasibly do that and then they would drive it the rest of the way but that really sped up the project. Um, this uh, drive housing and the uh, boiler housing uh, were housed within a structure itself. And you'll see a photo uh, when you see this part. It just looks like a building sitting on this platform. But they also had a lifeboat attached to the back of it. Then they used flat cars and uh, dump cars. The flat cars brought the pilots out and the crane would be able to swivel 180 degrees, pick up a piling, swing back around, set it. Uh, before they put the, uh, or after the pilings were put in, they would put in what were called fascines and you can see how they were suspended down below and then lowered into place down here. And then rock would be dumped on the top of that from, from rock cars. And I'll show you a picture of a, a fascine in a second. Gary. Yeah. Excuse me, but I also missed something. What's all that structure up above? Oh, that, it was a model. And that's just the building in the background. Oh, OK. Um, and, uh, we found some photos at the uh, uh, Columbia Pacific Heritage Museum, and I think the model was built for the uh, Columbian Exposition as a demonstration model. But here's a close-up. You can see the after the, the bench were put in place, they would lower these fascines onto the floor of the ocean or the floor of the river, and the purpose of that was to uh, basically stabilize the floor and prevent water from washing out the sand under the rocks that they're going to place on top of it. And uh, they are basically just bundles of uh, twigs that are bound together. Oh, wow. Uh, so they put the fascines down, then they would put small rock, fill it up to the desired height, and then they would dump what's called cap rock, which is a bigger rock that's going to be moved less by the way. And you can see in the background how the dump cars drop these down here. And so this is a fascine. Uh, it's been a common uh, tool of military engineers for hundreds of years. And in this case, they used it for uh, the, uh, the jetty in a horizontal configuration rather than uh, building embattlements. Uh, and I always chuckle when I think about this. The, uh, who was the subcontractor that made the fascines? Yeah. And <laughs> we're talking about a lot of them. They're basically about a foot or uh, 
16 inches in diameter, twigs bound with wire, and uh, looks like they were fairly consistent length. The, uh, I've uh, found some indication that actually part of the uh, job that the troops were stationed at Fort Stevens had was going out and cutting willows and making these, but I don't think that accounts for all of it. It's a private contract. So, um, the Corps of Engineers have done some work down in Galveston already and had uh, experience there with railroad tramways building uh, a jetty in Galveston Harbor. Uh, and they'd also done quite a bit of uh, uh, defense work where they build earthen revetments and they use uh, narrow gauge railroad uh, equipment on this wooden tramway or elevated railroad. And so that was the method that was chosen for here. And they, they looked at doing it by boat, but there's no way in the surf conditions and even in the, the time that a boat is going to be stable enough if you've got a 60 foot long, uh, maybe two foot diameter log pile that's trying to drive into the river, have that swinging around. <laughs> And uh, so we settled on uh, uh, what's called tramway construction. And narrow gauge equipment, uh, which is three feet between the rails versus uh, standard gauge railroad uh, that we see today, which is four feet, eight and a half inches between the rails. Mm -hmm. So the equipment was uh, proportionally smaller than standard gauge equipment. And uh, it also took less, because it's proportionally smaller, it takes less weight, has adequate power, but your structure that you're building to support it doesn't have to be as, uh, as big and as uh, robust. So the equipment they needed for building the jetties were locomotives, pile drivers, flat cars, dump cars, cranes, and tugs and barges. And they had to build a supply chain. Uh, virtually all of the rock that uh, went into the jetties was brought in from elsewhere. Uh, piles, lumber, fascines could be sourced locally. Uh, a lot of the other tools and stones probably also needed to be brought in. So uh, they needed a receiving facility or a wharf uh, when the stones came in by boat. They needed a service yard once they had everything to take care of their equipment. They needed a marshalling yard so they could organize all of the materials they're going to take out to the river. They needed the trestle and the uh, transportation, river transportation equipment itself. So this is a uh, wandering around the internet. Uh, I found this document, which is a U.S. engineer's uh, order for the, some of the locomotives that were uh, used in building the jetty here. And there are two interesting parts up in the top. You probably can't read this. Uh, it basically says to be used in a cold climate, Paran, Oregon. <laughs> uh, and then down here, this engine is to be, uh, to be run on the sea beach uh, where salt, water, and spray uh, may rush over it and protect all parts as much as possible from the action of salt water. <laughs> and um, it gives, down in this area, it gives a list of locomotives uh, that are part of this order and uh, actually found photos of a couple of those and there's a story about one of them that will be coming up in a minute. Um, this is what's called the Note 40, and the number designation that you see here is the pilot wheels or leading wheels on the locomotive, the number of driving wheels, and then the number of trailing wheels. And in this case, this locomotive only has four driving wheels, it doesn't have any pilot wheels or any. Uh, trailing wheels. And so it was a small, robust, lightweight steam locomotive and 
didn't have any problem with pushing loads of rock out onto the trampoline. Uh, one of the other interesting things is this is an early uh, part of the first phase of construction of the jetty between 1885 and 1895, and they were using flat cars at the time and manually pushing the rocks off on the uh, flat car <laughs> down into the water. <coughs> In the uh, far right here, this is uh, Cape Disappointment, uh, North Head area out here. Okay, this is a an 042 locomotive. It has no uh, pilot wheels in front. It has four drive wheels and a trailing wheel. The purpose of the trailing wheel is to help support the, uh, the firebox on the locomotive. And uh, this locomotive uh, is the classic, and it was one of the locomotives that was on the list, the, the order list. Um, this is an 042. It has no pilot wheels, four driving wheels, and two trailing uh, wheels, uh, and was probably the most common locomotive that they used out here during the first and second phases. And uh, can't really see it, but this locomotive right here is locomotive number four, and uh, we'll be telling a story about number four in just a minute. Um, this is an 044 uh, Baldwin. It's a bigger locomotive. Um, again, this is probably in the early phase of uh, jetty construction between 1885 and 1895. Um, although it, it could be in the second phase. This same locomotive, a uh, number of years later, on the Washington side of the river, the, the first photo was taken on the south jetty. This is on the north side uh, for the north jetty construction. So we know that, that they moved this equipment around, reused it. So, um, the second phase of the jetty from 1903 to 1913 um, has an interesting story. And it's on uh, January 13th of 1912, there was a 683-ton uh, four-masted lumber scooter called the Admiral that uh, ran into the westwardmost portion of the, uh, the jetty. And it strayed about 60 miles off course. They thought they were 60 miles out at sea. Wow. The storm had blown them in. <laughs> and uh, in the early morning light, the lookout saw the jetty just before they hit it. Uh, and I think at this point, I'll stop following this. And uh, Connie's going to read a story from uh, Graveyard of the Pacific, uh, Jane. Pacific Graveyard. Some yes. of you probably know this, but I have. <laughs> I probably know this story, but it's such a good little piece, I have to um, elaborate a little bit on that. So you know the history of it being 60 miles off um, shore, I mean onshore, when it thought it was offshore, and since the bar was impassable, uh, the, um, oh, sorry, uh, the, the uh, captain of the life-saving station uh, made arrangements to go to Fort Stevens and run the steam locomotive used for repairing the jetty out to the ship. With communication damaged, Wickland set out on foot for the fort, bucking the wind and rain for three miles until he had reached his destination. Both the engineer and the fireman who operated the locomotive volunteered to aid in the rescue, and after getting up steam, started the steel horse down the track. In the terrible wind and high seas, there was danger that the trestle had been carried away. The accompanying fog all but obliterated the track from view, and the engine crept along at a snail's pace. All eyes strained forward. Suddenly, on the track ahead, the engineer sighted the dim outline of a uniformed man carrying a bundle. The 
figure was down on his hands and knees, slowly crawling. The engine jerked to a stop, and the three men jumped out of the cab to aid the man who later, the man who later identified himself as Captain Joseph Bender of the schooner Admiral. The bundle in his arms was his infant child, which he held close to his body to keep it from freezing. Gasping for breath, the captain pointed down the track. My wife, my wife, he cried. Go get my wife. A short distance ahead, the engine clanked to a halt again, and there was the captain's wife, clad in a thin nightgown, which revealed her youthful form. <laughs> Wickland picked her up and carried her back to the cab where she fainted after asking for her baby. A hundred feet further down, the ship's cook was found on the trestle. With the cab filled, the little engine backtracked three miles to Fort Stevens to get medical aid for the survivors. There's more to this story, but that's the best part. <laughs> the good news is all of the crewmen were saved, even though they had run into the jetty across a breached area. The train went back out, used a breaching food, well, anyway, a line, Lyle gun, and got them safely across that breach of open water from jetty, you know, to, and to the uh, railroad, or to the locomotive, which saved them. So it's probably safe to say that this is the only time in history that a locomotive assisted in a rescue at sea. <laughs> And the uh, locomotive was uh, number four right here. So it's kind of interesting how, as you poke around, you find these little strands of history that tie together and make sense. Okay, pile drivers. Uh, this was a smaller one they used. What I think this photo is is as they begin the uh, second phase of jetty construction from 1903 to 1913, this was the configuration of the original jetty. Uh, and I'm not sure whether they're trying to drive piles or pull out these old piles, uh, but this would be uh, Megler in the background. And uh, so it's a smaller unit, it's got a steam boiler, looks like a fireman and an operator. And um, they're on a uh, tramway. And then this is a photo of the, uh, the big one, the, the mother of all pile drivers. Yeah. And uh, the uh, Pilings that you see across here, I would guess the uh, distance between the center line of the rails is 13 feet, so that would probably make these 60 to 70 feet long. And then here's another load of them over here on flat cars, and judging from this, they're probably uh, a minimum of about two feet in diameter, if not bigger. And. Uh, this unit is built on uh, four separate uh, flat cars that are tied together by, or not a flat car, but four separate uh, uh, cars that are tied together by a common frame. And then you can see the, uh, the structure built on the back here. Another one coming up is a little more clear. This is uh, a drawing that I found at the uh, Columbia River Maritime Museum. It's a scale drawing of the uh, pile driver. Uh, this is the uh, inlet down here for siphoning water that comes up and is used to siphon the, uh, the pilings down into the ground. And so you can see that the front of this has to overhang enough so that when the last piling is complete they can extend out, or the last bent is complete they could stand out far enough to start building the next one. So it was just working a step at a time all the way out. This is a plan uh, showing the same thing. Like a lifeboat built on the back here. Uh, a lot of photos of the locomotives you see, uh, they all have uh, life rings on the back of the locomotive. Wow. 
this kind of gives you a sense of the scale. You can see the, uh, the structure uh, probably bigger than this building that we're in. And uh, here is, there's been an accident where the uh, dump cars have gone off the track and they're picking them up. This is the uh, same unit on the north jetty on our side of the river. May I ask a question? Sure. On um, that one, well, on your previous pictures, it looked like there were two rail lines that the, the big pile driver was on. So there were flat cars on two sides that were the base. But this one, it looks like it's just kind of hanging out over the side. There, there are two uh, parallel lines. Right. It's in this photo, it's just hard to see. Oh, okay. There's got one here, and then there's another one in there. Uh -huh. This photo is just... Yeah. It's so the part on the left that looks like it's out over the water, that was just a counterbalance? Yes. The, okay. Yeah, because when they would, uh, you know, a 60 or 70 foot yeah, log that's two or three feet in diameter, yeah, sure. uh, they probably had to pump water in and out to counterbalance. Okay. Thank you. Okay, flat car is uh, a pretty uh, common rail car, but necessary. And here uh, you can see how a uh, locomotive would bring pilings out on a couple of flat cars, and then the uh, uh, pile driver would rotate around, pick up the piling, push it up, swing it back around, place it, and start to drive it. saw this one already. Uh, they used them also for placing rubble stone early on. Uh, here's one at Fort Canby and it's loaded with barrels of probably spikes and plates and bolts and uh, all the miscellaneous uh, stuff that's needed as they do the construction out in the water and push that out. It's their rolling supply house. Uh, as I said initially, they used the flat car, and one of the problems with the flat car is like uh, putting a heavy object on a table. If you try to push it off when you get to the edge, it may dump the table over before it falls off the table. And so that was, that was always a problem, and one of the draftsmen who was working on this project designed this car, and um, it's basically a cradle set on four wheels that has a uh, geared wheel and it can tilt sideways. Mm -hmm. And you can see how these feet mm -hmm. kind of come down and stop on top of the ties and brace the car so that as that uh, uh, table and pallet tilt up at an angle and the stone starts to slide off, it's protecting the car from being, being pushed off in the opposite direction. And whereas you needed three or four people handling all these rocks on other cars with a big wheel, I'll show you in another photograph, a hand wheel about this big, they could crank it and tilt the whole car and one person could handle it. But you can also see the size of the stones. Yeah, yes. Uh, one of the neat things, uh, this may be one of the first examples of intermodal shipping. Uh, they didn't have containers, but they had uh, wooden pallets. And they would, when the uh, boats came in with uh, barges full of rock from upriver, and most of this rock was sourced from the Fisher Quarry up in Vancouver. And we're talking about millions and millions of tons of rocks. So there was a tremendous amount of shipping activity that was taking place on the river to get, get the rocks down. But the rocks would arrive at the wharf, which we'll see in a bit, and they would load them on these wooden pallets, a car would come back, all they'd have to do is pick up the pallet, set it on the car, and take much less time than try to load the car uh, itself. Here's a uh, locomotive uh, marshal ready to go out. You can see they've got little stakes in the ground here marking where the car should be. And he's probably waiting, probably another train out there. 
uh, coming back and once he's cleared, we can take this load out. Um, this is in the second phase of the jetty. This is what they call the knuckle. And this is where the first phase ended opposite of Cape Disappointment. Uh, and then they continued out. And so these guys are out in the middle of some fairly deep water. Uh, looks like it's kind of a rough day. But you can also see these uh, uh, wheels on here for uh, turning the uh, the cars and the tilts. Here's on a really bad day. Um, not unlike yesterday or the <laughs> next couple of days, but if you just think about um, being out on wet boards, wind blowing, rain, really dangerous work and probably really, really uncomfortable. So gotta give these people credit for uh, uh, the effort that they put in. Um, one of the things, a couple of things I like about the, this particular photo, uh, these are some of the dump cars that for whatever reason came off of the uh, trestle. Uh, from an engineering perspective, you get to see some of the structure of the car that you wouldn't otherwise see. And then you see all of these guys that are working, and I find it really interesting uh, how they dressed when they were working out there. Uh, um, I haven't found any crane cars, but I'm pretty convinced that they, they had something similar to this. This was what they would use for lifting timbers into place on uh, different uh, parts of the construction work. Tugs and barges, um, so this is a barge load of rock that's come down from Fisher Quarry and there you can see they're uh, taking the pallets down here and putting the rocks on the pallets and then lifting them into place and placing them on the car, dump car. This is the uh, Tug Samson, and he's got uh, three barges of rock okay. to bring us down the river. And then this is, uh, this is from the 1930s. Uh, after the completion of the North and South Jetty uh, in 17, uh, no further work was done until uh, the 1930s, and they had to start doing repairs on both the North and South Jetty. And uh, in the latter part of the 30s, probably about 36 to 38, uh, this barge called the Mastodon was used out here. It was originally in service uh, between New Orleans and the other side of the river, and it hauled, uh, as is depicted here, passenger, rail passenger cars back and forth. And when a bridge was built, the Mastodon was brought out here and put in use here. The Mastodon was 368 feet long by 50 feet wide. And so if you think of it, it's about a quarter of the size of one of the ocean-going ships that we see out here. So it's a big vessel. Here's another view of it. And um, the records indicate that the Mastodon um, brought 7,000 carloads of stone down to the North Jetty from the uh, Kelso or Kalama area. Uh, and the rail on the, on the uh, Mastodon was standard gauge. And by the 1930s, when they worked on the uh, repairs to the North and South Jetty, they had rebuilt all of the trestle work into standard gauge mm -hmm. and uh, were now able to bring uh, rock from the south jetty out by rail all the way through Astoria and out to uh, the jetty and just mm -hmm. take the rail cars directly out onto the, uh, the jetty and then uh, would use equipment 
uh, mounted on other rail cars to pick the rocks off and place them, and then they simply haul them back. So it was much less laborious than bringing the rock out by uh, uh, barge uh, as they were before. Uh, this was from uh, 1888, or about the time they finished, uh, just after they finished. <coughs> the, uh, I'm sorry, about three years into the uh, construction of the first phase of the South Jet. Yeah, looks like they just had a simple uh, wharf out here and then uh, came around here and on out to the, uh, the jetty. Um, about ten years later, we see a much more complex wharfing structure out here, uh, a lot of support equipment, and uh, the jetty line running out there. And then this is 1902. Uh, by, by 1902, the uh, Astoria and Columbia River Railroad uh, had brought standard gauge railroad out here. Uh, they used it for uh, marshaling troops if they needed to bring a group of troops in or take them out somewhere, they would do it by rail. And then they also connected standard gauge over to uh, the uh, jetty rail road, railroad, which at that time was still um, narrow, narrow gauge. But at least by this time there was interface with the outside world. Uh, and you can see on this uh, photo of the, uh, the South Jetty War, uh, the tremendous amount of activity. You've got all these cars that are lined up ready to go out. Uh, you've got all these derricks, which are all steam powered. And these are the uh, boilers that uh, run the uh, individual motors on the derricks that are picking the rocks and placing them on the cars. Another shot shows the complexity of the track work. This is the marshalling yard where um, you see the pilot's marshals there for loading onto the car and bringing out uh, continuing the construction. This is a 1946 map from Fort Canby. The uh, wharf by this time had been shortened up significantly. This is right in the area where the uh, uh, Fort Canby boat launches today with the uh, violin sculpture. And this line uh, runs out to the, uh, the A jet. And this is the line to the North jet. Uh, this was from probably about 1913, 1914. Uh, this is the uh, warping area for the North jetty construction. Uh, most of these pilings are still uh, visible today. The, the, the top part of it is long gone, but the pilings themselves are still there. Again, you can see the level of activity. And I'm not sure how Charlie Chaplin got here. But, uh, <laughs> So not, not quite as big as the, uh, the South Jetty facility, but still a uh, pretty significant piece of work. Uh, this is a photo when they started in 1913-1914 uh, with the construction of the North Jetty. This is where the shoreline was for the, uh, the ocean. And um, this is probably about where the uh, ranger station is today, where you pay your fees to go in and out. You've got uh, the uh, Fort Canby boat launch area in the background. 
So the water was all the way up here at this time. And I think this uh, shot was taken from uh, McKenzie Head. This is um, also a shot of Fort Canby. You can see the uh, track work. Looks like the track work is under construction. And this construction. And this is probably about the time that they were beginning the uh, repair work on the North J. Um, but I think this is standard gauge railroad as, as opposed to uh, narrow gauge railroad. So it's a, a later photo. This is a trestle that uh, ran out. Uh, basically, it intersected the line about where the uh, convenience store is at uh, Fort Canby, mm -hmm. right down at the intersection. From there, out around through the middle of what's the Coast Guard Station today and out to uh, AJ. Um, the, uh, the pile dikes, uh, although they're not as prominent as um, the jetty construction, one, one of the points of interest is that these photos that you're about to see were all taken by Charles Mulvey. And uh, he had some fabulous uh, photographs of the work that was going on on Sand Island. Um, and I haven't done the research or taken the time. And I'm sure there's a lot of information in the local newspapers about what was going on at the time. But um, in the local history, it doesn't seem like there was any intersection between Chinook, Waco, the peninsula, and the construction of the jetties. But I'm, I'm really confident that there were a lot of people that lived there that, that worked on those projects. Uh, and an interesting project would be to try to find some of that connection. Uh, this is a pile bike. This is uh, actually pile bike number five. It comes off the uh, end of Sand Island nearest the uh, uh, Chinook uh, entrance. The individual pilings are driven into the ground in a staggered manner, and then they run a timber between them and bolt them together. Oh. And you, this is an aerial shot, and you can see the tide is outgoing in this photo. And so as the water is flowing through, when it hits the pile dikes, it's like a uh, a sieve, but it's got enough resistance that it starts to back up water, and you can see how it's being forced out around the end of the pile line, and that current is intended to help scour, scour the channel, keep the uh, material moving. This was a uh, different kind of locomotive. It was an 040 uh, tank engine. The tank just simply means it's got its water uh, storage uh, in a separate tank that's on top of the uh, boiler itself. Dump cars are a little bit different in this uh, photo, and this is primarily because most of the rock that was used on the uh, on Sand Island was probably basketball-sized kind of rock. There's a shot of uh, a load of rock and you've got a die a guy opening the car and dumping the rock down both sides. Um, pile drivers here were like the smaller pile drivers from the north side. Um, I suspect these were probably built for this project. In the background here you can see pile driver out on the jetty itself. So you've got the, the construction technique they were using was uh, they would drive the piles in a staggered fashion and then build the trap on top of the uh, piles and just work their way out into the water. But you basically had something that was only four or five feet high that you've got this equipment riding on and working on. He had another shot, you see a pile driver working in the background out here. You can see the uh, nature of the construction of the uh, spur dam to the pile dikes.
This is an interesting photo. Uh, this wharf was on the backside of Sand Island. It's not there today. Uh, the piling field in support of it still is. Uh, but on this uh, barge full of rock, there are 13 people working here. They've got this basket that they're lowering down. They would load the rock into here and then <coughs> lift it up and load it into the cars to take it out and being dumped. So a tremendous amount of hand labor. But this is also in the middle of the Depression, so it was probably pretty good work and people were pleased to have the opportunity to do it. Um, this is a Corps of Engineers photo from uh, 1938, January 38, I believe. And the wharf that we were just looking at is this piece right here. And there were about three miles of um, narrow gauge rail built on Sand Island to construct these uh, spur dams or pile dikes, go by one name. You can see in this photo, uh, Jetty A has not been built yet. We've got the North Jetty up here and the beginnings of the aggravation, ag aggregation of all of the sand at uh, Benson Beach. Uh, from 31 to 36, uh, major repairs on the South Jetty, uh, including building a concrete cap uh, was a huge piece of concrete, maybe about the size of a couple of ships. And all of, all of the material was again done on a trestle, taken out and uh, placed by <coughs> rail. And then from 38 to 40 they worked on the uh, North Jetty and uh, this was when the, uh, when the Mastodon was, was in use. So between 85 and, and 40 you can see the original land configuration right here, this green shape. Cape Disappointment up north and uh, Point Adams down here and the river in between. And by, uh, by 1940, 1950, we have the aggregation of the beach, the uh, buildup of Plats of Spit, uh, all the buildup of Benson Beach and the aggregation up here and Sand Island stabilized in the river in a stable channel. So. Uh, they had accomplished quite a bit in that period of time. Gary, I think I'm going to have to interrupt you here, but what I'm thinking of is, is there a part two? Like, can we schedule you for spring <laughs> to, to finish? Yeah, you this is long Oh, you're at the upper one. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good time. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, by the eve of World War II, the, the river had been narrowed from uh, six plus miles down to two. Uh, maintained, increased the maintained depth from 20 to 40 feet. Um, about 50,000 piles have been driven. Uh, these are estimates. 140,000 fascines fabricated and placed. 12,300,000 tons of rock quarried, loaded, and moved to the jetty. And probably used about 20 million board feet of lumber. And so this was all accomplished by engineers, railroaders, laborers, boatmen, um, with equipment that we would consider very crude today, uh, but yet they, they did a lot with it. And it was state of the art when they were doing it. So, with that. <laughs> <laughs> more to the story and that you know we're up to about we have 50 years to go right and there's still more happening there all the time i um, i just feel one more time that there is so much to celebrate about this river and that's kind of our focus and our theme right now is to celebrate the, the, the river and so thank you and i feel 
the education that I feel and enrichment in, in what was experienced today. I hope you feel that way too. I think I sense that there are questions. Sure. And so feel free to linger and ask them, but some of you may feel like you need to. Just, just one quick question. Mm -hmm. When you're looking south now, you see the end of the jetty, then you see a gap, and then you see more jetty. Is there a big gap now? There, there is, and the end piece that you see is the pile cap that was built up there. If you've ever been out close to it, it's concrete and it's layered. It kind of looks like stone from a distance. But, uh, and then the uh, the area between the end of the the, uh, the jetty cap and the visible jetty today uh, is fairly close to the surface, but it's been washed out. And there was concern back in 2007; they did a fairly significant uh, repair project on it because there was concern that the jetty would be breached about midway between the the, the breach and uh, where it ties into uh, class of spit. So, is that, is that answer? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to know if you know whether the class of spit lighthouse was gone when, it, when they started with the jet. I, I don't know. My suspicion would be that uh, it was around co-located near Point Adams, and so it was probably still there during the early phases of construction. I don't know when it was taken out of service. Are there any of the most locomotives left at all? That were they able to salvage any of them that you know of? Not that I know of. Yeah, the artifacts, uh, are they uh, any plans on rebuilding those? Those are in terrible shape. Especially out from Chinook to the island, the Sand Island over there are just literally falling apart. The Corps is looking at it right now. Um, there was some talk that it was to be done this year. I think it's pushed off a couple of years. Um, they're struggling for funds, so they readjust their priorities. Uh, I'm not sure, in my own mind, I'm not sure that the pile bikes would do the same thing today that they did then. I think one of the big differences uh, in the buildup of siltation, like in the Chinook Channel and the Owaco Channel, is you know, Sand Island has been breached in the middle. And before the water would have to flow in, build up behind Sand Island, then when the tide went out, the water would go out around the ends and probably help wash those channels. And now it's got a separate route to go in and out in the middle of Sand Island. So. Uh, that's just my opinion. It's probably not a good engineering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, being out there fixing it, fixing the tight, it just roars out of it. Yeah, it just really just really roars out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Do they know how many accidental deaths took place while the building of this? I I don't know. I haven't seen anything in writing on it. Uh, I would imagine there were a few, but. It looks like they were also prepared for uh, people falling in the water and that kind of thing, but certainly a dangerous, dangerous business. Thank you. <laughs>